Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo bros, it's Uncle Yo here, back with another show, and today I have an old friend that's doing big things. I want to introduce you to Ryan McGinn. What's up? Ryan, it's a pleasure to have you here, dude. Thank you for inviting me. Man, there's so much that we could talk about because Ryan and I are old friends, one of my first friends when I moved down to Florida. Uh, I was on my grind raising my family, had no friends, wasn't interested actually (laughs) in having friends, but this guy is so damn friendly that he stuck around and here he is. But not only that... We want to dive into what Ryan's doing these days, and you might not know his name, but you know his style. If you're watching any reels, uh, TikToks, um, any short form vertical videos, and you notice the bold text that people use and the emojis that people are using, this this uniquely short form style of uh, drawing people into the videos with, with uh, animations, this is the dude that came up with it. And I know it for a fact because I saw the first one that he did and he said, hey, I think this is going to take off. And here it is. So it's so funny because I get hit up by young uh, entrepreneurs all the time who are wanting to do TikTok edits for me. And then they're showing me uh, videos that are edited by you. And they're telling me, hey, I can do Alex Hormozzi style videos. I can do Grant Cardone style videos. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, I know the guy who made that up and does those. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, I'm still kind of humbled. Like, I don't know how to like accept the fact that I created that. Like, because a lot of people don't know that I created it. And it's like kind of, but I mean, you know, I'm big on showing proof. And uh, like, if anybody wants to fact check this podcast, if you go to July of 2020 on my TikTok account, you will uh, see the first video ever on TikTok, which was created with those styles, which was done by me and then i just so happened to be working with some large clients two of which elliot mentioned i have ndas so i don't oh he can't say i like to honor my ndas but you know who they are and uh yeah um we started rolling it out through their accounts really quickly um and it really took off i mean nobody could have guessed i mean you know alex is you know what i consider like a really a unicorn the guy's amazing and you know i just was a part of what was about to happen for what he did. And same thing with Cardone. They just, the shit just took off. And like, then it became their styles. And then I started working with Ryan Pineda um, and then boom. And then now we have 25. Dropping names, dropping names, keep it going. (laughs) And I know there's big, big, big names. Yeah. We have, we have a lot of names. We have uh, almost 25 clients now. We, my, I say my team, uh, we as a company, which has been started in the last year and a half, uh, does close to 2,000 videos a month to all the short form platforms. We've created well over a thousand viral videos on TikTok, which is 1 million views or more in 24 hours. And I have spreadsheets of proof for that. And uh, I just kind of gotten obsessed with, I mean, going viral on, on TikTok specifically, but it just so happens to work for all the other platforms too. So. And you have like an eye for what's gonna take off and what's not, what's gonna be viral and what's gonna be ignored. And it's been a long time coming, dude. Yes. Uh, I knew Ryan when we both first created our original TikTok, not TikTok, I'm sorry, way before TikTok, Twitter accounts. Twitter, I made my first YouTube in your presence, perhaps. Yeah. First video. Uh, This was back, we met some met in like 2003, 2004, I want to say. Yeah, I mean, we were just trying to figure out before we started recording. It has to be 15 years. I mean, I'm 39 now. Um, I quit Lo- my job at Lowe's when I was probably 25 to pretend to be a Tell us about <laughs> you quitting Lowe's and joining me in strength camp yeah. way back in the day, bro. So I, uh, yeah, so I had really, I had this idea. Uh, I was on a forum, Zach Evanesh, shout out to, he's a good homie. Uh, yep. He had a forum and I, there just happened to be this, you know, I thought I was like the only person interested in flipping tires and stuff back then because 
like, as you know, it wasn't the cool thing to do back then. Right. Like, it was weird. And it was underground. Yeah, it was literally underground. And Zach Evanish happened to be kind of creating this forum where he was like the only person doing it. And I was like, yo. And then you posted a flyer in there, like getting critiqued on, like, I think the marketing of the flyer or something. And I was like, wait, that's like 10 minutes from me. This guy lives in my hometown. I was like, well, I'm just going to pay the 20 bucks or whatever you were charging for the workout. Go meet him. I said, he feels. If he's into this, he has to be a cool guy. Well, then I met you, you know, showed up for your workout. You know, one, had a lot of fun doing the workout. And two, I don't know, like you had this vibe about you that I was like, man, I feel like I should just be around this guy. And he probably won't like me at first, but, you know, <laughs> maybe he maybe I could buy him lunch or something. You were useful because you brought <laughs> around the first tractor tire that I ever flipped. And you would bring it on your truck and we would go out in the park. Now, if you go to my Strength Camp YouTube channel, which is where I blew up, and you go to the very first video on my YouTube channel, you're going to see he and I flipping this, what, 500-pound tire. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was, it was a pain in the ass to bring out. But that, for, for a networking tip as far as like, I like to teach people how to make friends. And I was like, this guy probably wants nothing to do with me. I said, how do I, how do I make myself valuable to him and make him want to invite me places and like, and you know, eventually become my friend. I was like, I'm going to go find the tractor tire. And I, had, a, I happened to have a truck. Bro, that's totally <laughs> a gift of yours. One thing for sure is that you have always marched by the beat of your own drum. And you and I were like diametrically opposed, totally different people. I rocked like a short haircut, baldy fade probably, was lean, fit, and trim, didn't drink a drop of alcohol, <laughs> eating only organic food, and I was militant about strength camp. This kid would roll up with cut off t shirts with his hair, still have uh, spike <laughs> blue hair. Every other week he had a different hair. He'd roll up, and I say kid because it was so long ago, bro. We've known each other 15, almost 20 years perhaps. And uh, you were literally a kid, and you would I come know. up and you were drinking your big gulp and <laughs> listening to punk rock music. For all intents and purposes, uh, you were the opposite of the kind of person I would hang out with. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had that vibe. <laughs> I don't know if I still have that vibe, but like back then, I definitely, I had like, I guess the, you know, I, I was at the time just turned pro professional on my BMX bike. So I had. You were BMXer, right? I was a BMX racer. And like, we just had like chips on our shoulders. We were like the, the outcasts in high school. We weren't the cool kids. Like, so it's like, that's how I like grew up, mm -hmm. you know? And I always, I always had a lot of friends though. I never had a problem meeting friends. And I always, you know, found my ways to be useful to get invited to the cool parties. So I always associated with going to the cool parties with meeting new friends. And that's just kind of that vibe. Plus extreme sports was like this version of myself back then that, I don't know, like it was interesting. I, I, I could have done without the hair looking back. That mm -hmm. was a little phase I went through, but you know, I mean, hey, it got me remembered and- No, yeah. you know what? I admired that because in a way I'm a rebel too, maybe in a different way, but uh, I admired your willingness to be different, to be yourself. It didn't matter what I was doing. You wanted to be a part, you wanted to crash the strength camp party <laughs> right and you came and you made yourself completely integrated with the things that i was doing like remember the first time we met tom mitchell <laughs> yep tom mitchell was my first strongman coach my only real true strongman coach he's the guy that taught us the game introduced us to uh, strongman competitions you were doing it you were ruthless you were relentless you would carry yokes or lift stones till your blood was coming out your nose and uh we had some really rough tough but awesome times mm -hmm. together uh with that old badass in his front yard yeah that was i, I tell people about that because they're like oh you ever gonna do that again i was like absolutely fucking not i want i have no desire you gotta be a masochist like, you gotta like punishment in a way like we did it for i think i mean well like i did it with you for like strongman for you know, what was it, maybe two years total like over the course and it was like but that saturday morning workout like mm -hmm. that Saturday morning workout would also keep me from not drinking on a Friday night. So like I did respect the Saturday morning workout. That's right. And uh, yeah, that was like the the high. And it was like, but it wasn't just Saturday morning workout. It was also we were probably gonna go eat like three hamburgers or something stupid after we got done. And I was like, I would always cherish those times. I was like, I just have to get to the workout to have those like. And it was always like a group of us, the like, friendly fun time yeah. at the end. And it was like that was always the you know the, at the end of like okay we just killed ourselves. But I've always had that personality even now. Like I mean I'm big on CrossFit now. I, you know, it's, I was thinking about on the way up here, I was like, man, it's like yesterday, I'm like, my body is so sore today. 
And I'm like, I'm like, shit, I'm not going to make a workout today. We but bonded through training. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, you had football, the football background, obviously I had BMX and like, that's all I did was I would get home from school and I would ride my, the kids don't do this shit now. Like I would ride my bike from, I would like in high school, I would get out of school at like 150 or whatever in the afternoon. And I would ride my, I'd go home, get my bike. And I would come back at nightfall, like seven, 8 PM every single night. And I would ride my bike, my BMX bike miles going to like jump curbs. And like, and that was just, that was how I lived. And like you fall, like it's lonely. Like sometimes mm -hmm. you had people to ride with, sometimes you didn't, but that was just what I did. Cause we were, you know, I had the aspirations of being a professional athlete. So I was yeah, like, you did like, you know, I mean, I did become one. I just was in that awkward I am too good to be amateur, but not good enough to be a top professional. But mm -hmm. then you just kind of just make no money. That's just what that turns into. And yeah. and yeah, but that led me to but meeting you. Like when I first met you, though, uh, like the reason I saw value in like, I want this guy to like me. I got to do whatever I can to make this guy <laughs> like me was just because, I mean, my dad was an entrepreneur. So I don't want to I want to give my dad some credit. Yeah. But I didn't really have many. Entre I had no entrepreneur friends. Right. And I was like, this guy's just like got this attitude about him where he's just going to i feel like he's going to make a lot of money or do something really cool and i was like i just want to be somewhere in the wings if that does happen because maybe i'll learn from it and then you know because of you and like you know you introduced me to tim ferris's four-hour work week and the four-hour work week turned into us making that whatever it was a hundred dollar bet that we made of who could finish the product first that's right you yeah, know we you, both created our first digital product product back in that time you period. Know, looking back you taught me a really valuable lesson on not relying on anybody because i Oh, I man. lost the bet because you got yours done faster because, you know, shout out to my dad. I love you, but he took a while to get the DVD done. Right. Because I made a DVD and you wrote a book. And I'm so self-reliant. I don't know if that's a good thing, but I do best when I do everything myself. And so it was pretty cool that you learned that lesson, man. I grew up in New York. I grew up on Long Island. Uh, I grew up in a totally different environment than you. It was a dog eat dog. <laughs> it was ambition or death. And uh, you grew up in Pinellas Park. <laughs> it's technically Largo. Yeah. You know? Nobody like likes to trailer admit that park. they live in Pinellas Park. But, it, but I had a good, I mean, you know, I mean, by all sakes, like I didn't have a hard childhood at all. My my parents, you know, looking back, they got me whatever I wanted. Like it was, I never only struggled. Child. Yeah, I was only child. Like I, I never really like struggled. Like, you know, yeah, there was times I think because my dad was an entrepreneur that like, he was struggling, but I never felt that. So, I mean, shout out to him for making me not feel that. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have that story where it's like, yeah, I lived in the streets and I was poor. Like, no, like I had the best bikes. I traveled the country, rode my bike from the time I was like nine years old until I was like 25. Yeah. Like my mom drove me to bike races for, you know, I mean, she drove me to New Jersey from Florida for a bike race. Like, like I don't still look back. Like, I don't know why she did that. I wouldn't. I won't. I don't know if I'll do that for my daughter Like right. now. Like that was a little wild. But yeah, like I, you know, it's just. But that it was the mentality of like just the extreme sports. Like I think it breeds loners. Not and like in a good way, like self reliant. Like I think more kids should do that. Like and it's like the you know, and you do probably I mean, I never did, you know, like football. Like I never had that like because I actually tore my ACL riding my bike before, like middle of high school. Like when I was like a you know, sophomore in high school. So like I couldn't even do team sports in high school. So that maybe even more dependent on like on riding my bike. Um and because of that, I just never experienced that camaraderie of like football, which like looking back would have been cool to have that. Yeah. That's what strength camp was. Strength mm -hmm. camp was my version of football camaraderie, but doing different things with odd objects. Mm -hmm. And we were on the cutting edge doing that, dude. There's this one picture, maybe we'll use it for the thumbnail, of you and I after. So check it out. Uh, Ryan was a party animal. <laughs> and uh, you, as much as you were a good influence on me, I, I was a good influence on you. Uh, you were a bad influence on me. I was. Because I hadn't drank in years. <laughs> but I wanted to fill up some kegs because we know that with Strongman, you carry kegs, you press <laughs> kegs, you work out with beer kegs. And uh, in order to get those <laughs> kegs, Ryan was like, let's throw up a, a, a keg party <laughs> at the gym. So we have this picture with he and I after several, I mean, we must have did a bunch of keg parties yeah. to get our family of kegs and uh there's this picture of us just carrying the uh, you know holding the kegs yeah because you can't uh at the time now it's like you can get kegs because i think people like they know that people like like us or people you know want them to do this stuff with but at the time you had to drink a whole can keg of beer to get the keg so it was right. like, and then you paid for the keg because you got charged because you didn't bring the keg back 
So it was like, I think it was like they charge you like 75 or 100 bucks for the keg. Yeah, so it was right. like, and we had like 10 of them there. So we didn't, like, I mean, well, you technically spent a grand. I was broke. So, like, you spent a grand to acquire the kegs, and we had a keg parties. Like, I think we had five to seven keg parties to, yeah, to get the kegs. Did. You know, so, but still, I bet the strength camp members love those parties. Except for that last one, it got a little weird. <laughs> like, yeah. You can't do like 10 without having one bad one. So, statistically, I think yeah. we, it was a win. <laughs> like, yeah. You introduced me to a lot of people, a lot of cool people. Mm -hmm. I would have never gotten out. I don't know if this is a good thing or, or a bad thing, but as an entrepreneur, especially a young man in a new place, uh, putting my nose to the grinder, trying to get my business off the ground, trying to raise my family. I would have been a hermit. I wouldn't have left my house. I wouldn't have done anything if it wasn't for hanging out with Mikey. I say Mikey jokingly because he's kind of like Michelangelo. I like to think of him and two of our other friends almost fit the archetype of the of the uh, Ninja Turtles perfectly. <laughs> and uh, Ryan That's was true. definitely like Michelangelo. He, wanted, he would get in a fight and he would kick everybody's ass and he would work really hard. But then at the end, it's like pizza party, <laughs> yep. beer. Uh, let's go to, Ho I mean, we went to Hooters. <laughs> <laughs> that was our, oh man, <laughs> that's right. He, you were a staple at uh, well, I was wing, wing house. house. I was wing house, but there wasn't a wing house really close to the gym, so so we went to Hooters instead because you know they, they were a lot better back then. I don't I, like every time I go into one now, I'm just disappointed because you grew up. It's true. Back then, you were trying to bone all the girls that were uh, <laughs> serving us wings. You know, I've made some videos about that, about the the strategy behind actually becoming a regular at Hooters or Wing House or any type of like wing establishment or like sports bar establishment <laughs> and the, the the comments on those videos are hilarious because being a regular at wing house was like i met so many girls like and you don't meet like the whole point of the videos like was not to encourage guys to have sex with every girl that they talk to at wing house or hooters like you know that's not the goal the goal is to become friends with all the girls because when you're friends with multiple girls it's a lot easier to hook up with other girls because you go out with girls, you're surrounded by females. More females are, are you know, they're open to approach you because they think, oh, he's a safe guy. He has friends. He talks to a lot of women. Yeah. He's not a weird. He's not a creep. He wouldn't have five girl friends that are girls if he was a creep. So it's right. like, in my opinion, if you're a single guy and you're watching this, it is the easiest way to get laid. It's like, laid. I forget what they call it, but it's like a third party referral, mm -hmm. right? Like Social it's proof. easier to do pre business with somebody who other people are doing business with. Mm -hmm. So you knew like these pick up red pill sort of things way before, I mean, it was even a thing. Yeah. It was funny to watch yeah. you in action. Yeah. I, I, and again, I, I never, I never, like, I love the pickup community. I wish, part of me wishes it would come back for the generation in which like most of these young men are like growing up in now because- mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some oddballs and some weird and some creepy shit that comes out of the red pill community. But at the same point, like it really breaks guys out of their shell. And, yeah. it, and it did a lot for me. It made me a lot like, you know, very social and very well liked. And, you know, all those skills and of talking to women and like meeting girls and, you know, transferred over into now. Like, I mean, people ask how I have so many high level clients and that work with me for my agency. It's because I'm just. I have no problem make, making friends. Right. It's like I talk to people and like they yeah. like me. And then like I do things to make them like me. And Either then, that or you're relentless. Yeah. Or I'm just annoying. Keep like, showing up. Keep showing up. I don't know if I'm annoying show it like, but I'm like, yeah, like that's the one thing you said. You're like, he just, he just right just shows up. That's how I was in my workouts. Like I was never the first one done, the last <laughs> one, but I was there. <laughs> like I would always show up. Oh, reliable. Yeah. And that, I think there's value in that. People don't show up now. Like they don't, they, like I was watching the tape video. Uh, with Zuby, actually, you you just had him on. You said, and he was talking about how like everybody today is a coward. Like men are cowards today, and I was just like, you know, it's aggressive. But I just think nobody has accountability. Nobody just shows up. Like I just had a free event. We registered two hundred fifty people to sign to come to the to an event in St. Pete, and a hundred showed up. I was like, what the fuck? The other hundred and fifty do? Like, hey, that's a far cry from where you started, <laughs> I know. bro. Well, I'm not I'm not upset about the turnout, but I yeah. the marketer in me is like why do people sign up for things and not show up? Like, I just would have been like, man, that's a good event. I wish I could show up. I'm just not going to show up. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe the next one. I wouldn't sign up, go through the survey, like do all the things and then just be like, just never show up. Like, You're persistent. I think <laughs> it, I, I think about how we started out with your first DVD, right? Remember the, the BMX DVD it was a flop. Mm -hmm. And then you figured out how to game 
uh, Google yep. with like these sniper websites. I don't know if you guys remember back in the day, if you're a little bit old, you might remember, but there would be like these affiliate websites that would rank in Google back when Google was equal to <laughs> easy to rank in. And uh, you were making you were making bank just cranking out these, what they, what did you call them again? They were like- well they, well, they were like, they were they were flogs, like fake, fake blogs. Yeah. Like, and, and yeah, like I had two that were very lucrative. Uh, and like, so people, this was like SEO and this is, you can't do this anymore. It was like 2008, yeah, 2009. It, yeah, it was like, and you could just make these, like you could just buy an exact match domain, which means that it's the exact wording that somebody would search was the .com or .net or .org. Like, and I, my two most lucrative sites, one was jerseyshoreabs.org. And then actually that was lucrative, three lucrative. That one plus this, the situation workout.com, .org. And then I also had Chris Evans workout.com. And all those sites, like, because of how, like, the situation in Jersey Shore and then the Chris Evans transformation for Captain America, like, I would write a really good article on the page because I was definitely interested in health and fitness and strength training. So I knew what I was talking about. You know, so I wrote a good article and then I linked off to all this cool, um, to whatever <laughs> wasn't always the best product, but it was the highest commission product. Mm -hmm. And those sites would just day after day, week after week, month after month, just continually make, you know, I would get $31 commission for everything, for every person that purchased anything from those sites. And between all those, they were doing like two to $300. Plus when that worked, I, I, I hired, I went to Elance and I hired, um, some Filipino, um, outsource workers. And I would pay them to set up the, the the flogs for me, and then I would write the main article. And I was doing it. I had increased testosterone dot org. I had that. get bigger arms dot net. I had, um, you know, I don't even know. I had I had over five hundred of them at one point, yeah. and they were doing like five consistently five to seven hundred dollars a day. And I think that was like the peak of my degeneracy when that was happening because. I just woke up every morning with like another seven hundred dollars in my bank account, and like, then you go blow it. And then I would literally go blow it that night on bottle service or drinking or whatever. I just bought dumb shit, bought a luxury apartment, like just never saved any of it. Like, don't recommend that. I just spent yeah. it all, but like it was a lot of fun. So I, I don't know if I, I bet you're paying it. taxes now. I am. I, oh, I'm getting. I hate talking about I'm taxes. Ed edit that out. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's a, I. I. It cost me twenty thousand dollars to work with a company called. Uh, clever profits to get my back taxes straightened up <laughs> and then now i have to pay the tax bill on that um which is right now i mean it's not as bad i think i own like 15 and which i, I mean i'm gonna pay i just have to like actually pay it and then this year though i am terrified of like what i'm about to pay yeah like because now i have 15 employees. it's a good problem because mm -hmm. the problem in the past was that you would you were a hustler bro mm -hmm. so you'd come up with a hustle until it you squeeze the juice out of it until the wheels fell off yep. and then it was another hustle it was another hustle and Ryan was never without the next hustle coming up always trying something new a lot of times there were they, I don't want to say counterculture but like where I was making ebooks creating courses doing uh DVDs of the month you were finding like these these strange little hustles tell us about you know because you've gone through so many of them it's interesting for people who are like seeking out success right now. They think that they're going to do something that's going to hit, but you must have tried a dozen different things <laughs> yeah. and, until you finally hit where you're at right now. What are some of the other hustles that you had used back in the day? Well, the first one was, I mean, just, I mean, to self-fund my BMX racing career, that was the, before the DVD, which we made together, it was just training BMXers on the side with, I had zero personal training experience. I just like knew how to, I, I liked working out. And I went to, and I liked to go to the gym. So I was like, oh yeah, people just come work out with me. And they did. So I was able to like make a few hundred bucks a week doing that. Um, helped a bunch of kids. One who's still my friend, little John, you know, little John. That's right. Um, like I think I helped shape part of his life growing up, but, mm -hmm. and then that turned into the DVD and then, but we didn't know how to build websites. I remember that. Like, I was like, I, this is like when you had to code entire websites. So like I spent like two months creating this DVD and then I'm like, you, you kind of did the same thing with the football program and you're like. Like nobody bought it at first. We're like shit, we gotta learn how to drive traffic. So then right. you're like, well, I'm just gonna try this video thing, and like on YouTube. And this is when YouTube wasn't cool. Like now right. it's cool. Back then you were a weirdo for making YouTube videos, and I was like, I'm like, well, shit. If you're making videos, I'll make videos. Cause, right. And then so we taught ourselves video editing, and then it turned into like, you know, then that morphed into once the DVD kind of. I mean, like. It was a failure from like a revenue perspective, but it taught me video editing and it taught me Big persistently win. video 
day in, day out, whether you feel like making it or not, like you just make a video and you post it. And then that morphed into the affiliate stuff because I was like, well, once I had done the videos for so long, I was like, well, I can make videos and websites about stuff I'm interested in. So then I already knew how to code. And now we had WordPress, so WordPress is really Yeah, easy. people don't know. It's so funny because I'll get clients sometimes that want to know, like, how do you make a website? And I'm like, dude, it's so easy. Like, they basically make it for you. Back in the day, we were, like, hacking codes in order like, to make these sites. You remember, like, uh, so, like, when I was learning websites, I was driving to – I was broke. Like, and I would go to Borders Bookstore, and I would read books on coding. But I couldn't afford to buy the book because – for whatever reason, the coding books were like $50, $75. Yeah. And uh, so I would like just read the books and I was like actually like page marking the books as I read through them. Cause I'm like, what kind of weirdo is gonna come here and buy a book on coding? So I just put it back on the shelf and I'd come back the next day and I kept reading. I read like I five, five or seven books that way, you know, in borders, sitting on the floor, like before I would go to the BMX races. Like that's what I, and then that turned into the SEO stuff because I learned how to code websites. And then that turned into, you know, like after that all kind of fell apart, I didn't really know what to do, but like, I still know how to make videos. And then like at that, well, you remember, cause my girlfriend at the time who I've been with now 12 years, uh, she broke up with me. So I was like really depressed, didn't know what I was doing with my life. And then I found fashion and style because I was just, that's right. I was just interested. You in, were doing the Aaron, Aaron Marino yeah, thing. I came across Aaron Marino, Antonio Santeno and like Tanner Guzzi and a few of my now really good friends. And I was like, none of these guys are really talking. And now I was a single guy, mind you. So I was like, what do I do when I'm single? Well, I spend all my money on drinking and I go out and I talk to girls. So when I, when I was doing that, I was like, man, these girls kind of respond. Like if you actually dress good, like girls like you more handsome guy yeah. secrets. And then handsome guy secrets was born. And then That's that right. turned into, <laughs> and then that turned into the YouTube channel because now it's like, Oh my gosh, I have something to make videos about every day again. So it was, you know, but when I made videos about, I'm like, I don't, the problem was I was always slightly late to platforms. Like with YouTube, like you were early adopter. Like I just didn't have somebody to commit to, to like, really like, I would have been early adopter had I had fashion when you started YouTube. Right. But, but when I hit YouTube, it was like two years after, you know, the period. So, you know, I I was able to garner like 25,000 followers, you know, signed to like menfluential agency. I know. And then I created a bunch of digital products and courses because I took the angle. That's right. Like I took the angle of dress better to get laid, yeah, and that turned into you were doing workshops, yeah, I was doing masterminds, but it was like on a much smaller scale, but still lucrative enough for me to make like six figures. It was niche. I think a lot of guys think that they need to hit it big with some huge uh, market where you were willing to be small and just take advantage. No, I say take advantage, but basically serve uh, a small market. You had a loyal following. Yeah, there was and there was people still follow me to this day, which is also a testament to being consistent on the internet on platforms. Yeah. But then that kind of like I guess I got censored a little bit on Google. Um, because I was super aggressive with my titles and thumbnails, like wear this to get laid, do this. Back then this is when like the I don't know what happened, but the com- like there was like a it was like a, a minor solicitation. There was like a lot of like problems with YouTube, how they were like uh like age restricting stuff and a lot of my videos were vul- considered vulgar because of cussing and like the titles. So a lot of my videos, I was getting like, I was just starting to really kind of get some traction with like, I, I think it was at like, I was getting like two or 300 subs a day and then everything just kind of like stopped and my views tagged and I was like, ah oh, shit, like this is not the first time I've been, cause that's what happened with the, with the websites. Like Google was like, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. Shut that shit off. And I went from like zero to hundred real quick. And then the, the YouTube kind of did the same thing. Plus I was back with my current, you know, fiance and I had a child on the way. So I was like, do I really want to be known for like dressing better to get laid in skinny jeans? Um, which is also out there. I still am known for that. Mm-hmm. But a lot of guys appreciated what you're doing. In fact, uh, I started taking tips from you cause I've never been a fashion guy <laughs> from the day you met me. I've been wearing the same clothes, yeah, the same daily thing. uniform. You love the daily uniform tip. <laughs> yeah, man. And if you look at my wardrobe, it's all the one uniform wear one pair of clothes. In fact, today I'm wearing something a little different. Quick shout out to carrier cross. Uh, check them out. They make some pretty cool clothes. Uh, about carrying your cross, being a strong Christian man. But you taught me, uh, and I resisted, 
Well, you taught me about various different forms of fashion at the time. So once again, Ryan McGinn, <laughs> you were a, a blessing in my life in that regard. Yeah, you, you found olive green, I feel like, because of me. And olive green became Perhaps. the- I, 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 was always wearing I was always wearing camo. You were in camo, camo. I really like the... this olive color. <laughs> I was like, you look good in olive. I mean, everybody, everybody looks good in olive, navy, and black, so it's like- Remember when it became like fashionable to wear camo, camo and, and olive? And yeah. I was like, everybody's copying me. Where's, <laughs> where's all that now? <laughs> Yeah. I'm still wearing it. I was like, Elliot, they're just wearing camouflage and olive. I don't know if you're the leader on the olive, but like, it's a good hey, color. <laughs> I'm a front runner in a lot of things. And you, I don't want to like were. brag, but a lot of things that uh, I come out with and, and start doing are way ahead of their time and people don't get them. And then by the time I get bored with them, it becomes the, 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 the bell curve. Well, you, I mean, and this is just speaking for how long we've been friends and how much like I've been influenced by you. Uh, especially your early days on YouTube, because you were the first person that just turned on a camera and talked. Like, yeah, that's right. No uh, edits. No edits. Just, pff, yo, Elliot, here we go. What do you want today? I got this question from Johnny Smith, and then you would just go. And the one thing that, that you told me, and I tell every single client I work with, because I film hundreds of videos a month with clients, and I'm like, look at the camera directly in the lens and burn your eyes through the lens. Yeah. And I learned that from you. You're like, because you, you, we were obviously big studiers of like Dan Kennedy, Robert Cialdini, and like more influential practices and psychology. And you're like, eye contact. You got to make good, strong eye contact. And I was like, that was one thing that always stuck with me, which is I think, and I do that now, like with my TikTok videos. Like, and I come off, like I've been told this because I just had these people at my event. I'm not, I don't think I'm arrogant on camera, but I'm very commanding and I have a, like a confidence that, on TikTok, it tends to trigger people because they're not that confident. And mm -hmm. like when you come across and I'm like, nope, this is correct. I do it this way. You're wrong. All of a sudden you start getting views because conviction. you're polarizing. Yep, conviction. Yeah. And that was like another lesson. You're like, just be, you know, <laughs> I'll never, me, you, Chris. Uh, I think Danny was with it. Danny was with us. I don't remember. We were in California. We were just, at, we were at one of Jason Capital's events. And we were going back to Jason Capital's house and me and Chris and like, we we're gonna have like a pool party and you were gonna do like some, uh, some bio interjects with JC. And me and Chris, like we were hung over from the night before and we weren't making very good decisions or like we couldn't decide. And you turned around, we were trying to figure out what we wanted to drink for that day. And you're like, you turn around from the front seat of this Uber and you're like, be decisive. I was like, I'll never forget that. Choose. So we just picked the first vodka and we bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, Yo, that's pretty. You know what's another amazing thing about the little world that we created in Podunk, St. Pete, down in the ghetto? <laughs> Man, it's crazy. That was a spark for a lot of people, including Jason Capital. Because of your friendly outreach, uh, this yep. guy, this young basketball player, real awkward, real quiet, started coming to strength camp. And he saw you and I up in the loft creating websites and doing internet stuff. Now he's incredible he yeah. blows up he's a, yeah i remember he came he's the in king i i i look to him now oh i i i i'm like man it's like how did i get such a smart friend like jc like when i'm like what is what is working in marketing or man i need to figure out how to make money with this jc's already miles ahead it's like all right yeah he knows and back back then he was alex yeah back then he was out he still i like he came clean about that yeah, like, I saw. like he had he, but it, but i mean once you commit i mean Let's be. I like his original name, but Jason Capital is a cool name. Like, it was amazing to see how <laughs> he, guys like him, like you, and I'm sure there are so many others, just kind of came in and got a whiff of the ama amazing little things that we were doing, and then they took it all, took it and ran. It became mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, I remember like I mean with JC specifically, like he was like, "What are you guys doing up there?" Because we would just work out, and he would work out. Well, he would do his own workout, some weird weird stuff over there that <laughs> basketball players do, and then he would just be like. And he would be sitting around and talking. And me and you were like, "Ah, right, we got to go upstairs. Like, we're going to go work. And we would just, you'd go to your computer, I'd go to mine, and we were like this. Like, and we wouldn't talk. And he's like, what are you guys doing? And Writing copy. Writing copy. Make editing videos. Like, it was always, like, one of those things. Or sending an email. And he's like, you think I can do this for basketball? And I remember you're like, yeah. And then he just left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but me and him did stay in contact because yeah. we became friends at that point. Um, he took it and ran. And he took that and ran, and he, I mean, by and large, is probably one of the, you know, I would say one of the best marketers you know, at this time on social media. I would I would give him that credit, yeah. you know, just especially when it comes to, like, monetizing Instagram and this newer social media platforms. 
like I mean, I don't know how much money JC's made doing that, but it's multiple tens, twenties, and millions. I don't even know how to count that high. Yeah. But he's a, he's a he's a fascinating character. Yeah. Um, so you're adaptive and you're you're persistent. And you're willing to change. You're willing to uh, evolve with the times. You were doing handsome guy secrets. I remember that was uh, probably around 2015, mm -hmm. 2016. We've been friends for so long. We're like those kind of friends where like we don't even need to talk to each other yeah. uh, for many, many, many months, uh, and then we catch up and it's just like we were talking before yeah. yesterday. Uh, so I don't, I, I didn't, can't even keep track of what you were doing after that. What, what was going on? Well, that went so after the YouTube like. I don't want to say they censored me. I don't know. Like it, it just the views crashed, and I was like, shit. And then I just kind of had to reevaluate because now I was having my daughter Chandler, and I was like, That's I just need, right. the, I need a big change, like another big change. I need, I, I'm really good at reinventing myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of keep all the good skill sets, and I just drop everything else and become something new. Um, so I was like, I, I kind of, and Kristen, my fiance, was like, you know, you should try Instagram. And again, so I was like, all right. So I started. That's right. So I was like, let's do Instagram. And then I got really good at taking photos, but I. I was still late to Instagram because I because you would focus I had focused on YouTube and you know because like I mean Instagram is now one, you know a big platform for you but when we jumped on Instagram it was late because we were everybody was focused on YouTube um, so we came to Instagram late and then but one thing I don't know I watched uh, I had a bunch of GoPros because that's what extreme sports guys those those are the cameras we buy like GoPros because it's, right, like, it's right. like drinking Red Bull you have Red Bull you GoPro. innovated a bunch of GoPro stuff yeah so I actually so hustles like so i got really into like filming vertical videos with my gopro because again i, I knew it was different and unique so i was like i can stand out my photos will look you're better. one of the first guys to make vertical videos i was like, i don't know if it was, but i was to commit to it because i did a story there was actually one dude before me that i got to give him props um i actually paid coaching for him. his name was jesse driftwood um peter mckinnon who was a big youtuber shared one of his friends jesse driftwood was making these vertical vlogs in their stories and i was like that's cool that's innovative. I'm it was it. stories. Yeah, it was you story. were making these like highly edited, awesome stories every single day. Everything. And I did it for over a year, and I didn't really gain that many followers. You weren't making any money. No you were money. Getting no headway. None. But you had the best looking stories. Yep. On but Instagram, I did make a little bit of money because a lot of because that was like in that period, like when the when the YouTube kind of tanked. I was for. I did save some money. Like I did have residual stuff coming in from Handsome Guy Secrets because like, I was smart with, That's recurring, right. with recurring revenue. But I had it calculated. I mean, I really only had like a year to kind of figure some shit out or else I was going to be broke again. But I mean, I'd been broke so many times. Mm -hmm. I'm never mm -hmm. scared of being broke. Like it doesn't <laughs> like, I mean, I could be broke again tomorrow. I'd be like, eh, well, been here before. Like, <laughs> who am I going to, who, who do I got to send a text to to like tell them I'll be late on my payment? Like, that's right. You know, it's like, so I, I, I think that's a good place to be because you, when you're not afraid of being broke, you're just like, and, yeah. and you have all, as you get older, I, I mean, well, I don't know if it's like that today with the way, you know, men are coming up and kids are coming up. I think it's a little different now, but like I just, I would always use that as a strength, like starting from scratch. But because I did the stories, a lot of the companies that I had done brand deals with started hiring me to do ads for them. And like, so I, I started a video production agency without even really trying to start a video production agency. And it was like, Hey, you know, what do you charge to do like 10 videos a month? And I'll be like, I mean, we'll send you all the footage. And I'm like, I don't know, 2000 bucks a month. And they said, yeah. So I got like two or three clients. And then next thing you know, it was like almost a six figure business again. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, and then, you know, I could outsource a little bit of the work, but I got, I was, I wouldn't say I was comfortable then, but I was just, I didn't want to, like, that wasn't the next thing, but I knew that that was enough to like, just kind of. Right. It was a bridge. It's to sustain. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, when TikTok kind of came along, I kind of like, I had gone to Bora Bora. Um, with Jason Capital, we had a mastermind together. I went to Bora Bora, I actually got engaged there. And I took a bunch of GoPro videos and, and pictures. And I, I came back and that was when TikTok was starting to get a little popularity. Still, Musical.ly. Yeah, it, it just switched from Musical.ly to TikTok. <laughs> and like, people were starting to talk about it. And I took my, you know, because I was making those stories, I took footage and I made a video and it was like 15 seconds long. I was like, oh, cool. So I just posted that to TikTok, you know, I created a TikTok, posted it, and that video got a million views. And I was like, whoa, hmm. holy shit. Like, that's cool. And then I did nothing with that because I was like, well, I don't, like, I, how do you recreate a video? What was board? this, like 2017? This is a little over two years ago. So like two and a half, two and a half, like, it was right, I mean, we're leading into, you know, the big C time. 
and yeah, uh pandemic yeah the pandemic you know and <laughs> this is like the year prior to the pandemic you know because tiktok was around for a while before it got popular during right. the pandemic so leading up to that i did that and then like i think i had like ten thousand followers and i was making other little videos with my gopro similar stories i was actually reposting some of the stories i used to make the better ones and you know they were getting a little bit of views but i didn't really have, i was like all right so there's a platform now for vertical video it makes sense i have the skill set but i still didn't really know what to do with it and then i started watching uh again jc and then also got to give him credit gary v um they were starting to pump out their educational content on tiktok in like 15 second format and i was like I was like, I can do that. And then now we're at like peak height. Trump's like, I'm going to ban TikTok because it's a Chinese. So this is like 2020. Yeah, this is right. Like lockdown happened. And he's like, I'm going to ban this app. And I was like, hold on, bro. I like you. Like, but <laughs> well, this, how you, I, I don't think that's a good idea. But long story short, when he said that, I go, it's time to go all in on TikTok. Because if it has that much popularity, and I saw that nobody was educating yet. There was still a few people. Right. And I had started messing with it, but I wasn't having much success yet. And then, you know, that's when lockdown happened. And then, you know, my fiance, Kristen, as you know, she's a, you know, technically a nurse. So she's going to, to do her thing. And we don't know if she's going to come home in a hazmat suit. Like, I'm like, like, what's going on? Like, right. this is like right beginning. We're like, are, are people, you know, we, we, you know, everybody at this point was a little nervous because they're like, this is weird. We've never seen this before. Um, so she's coming home, but I'm sitting at home now. And all my clients prior to this, once again, not was broke again because they're all like, they canceled. Like, like, we're not going to make any more videos. And I always thought that was stupid. I'm right. Like, I'm like, because whenever when you want to double down. Yeah, that's what I was, I was like. I said, I think that's dumb. But then a lot of them actually, like, apparently I was a little arrogant when I said that. Because a lot of them, like, asked me for refunds. And then it got to the point where, like, I couldn't refund anybody anymore because I was broke. So I had to, like, just say, uh, I'm not, I can't do it. And then everybody charged me back. So at the <laughs> <laughs> at the be beginning of the, the pandemic, at the height of lockdown... I had like negative $7,000 on my bank account, but I had pulled out $5,000 cash the day before all the chargebacks hit. Yeah. Like, because you know, if anybody's at a chargeback, you get 24 hours notice before the, they take the money out. And I was nice. like, oh shit. <laughs> so I went, literally went to the Bank of America up the street and I, I went inside. I said, I need to take out all my money. And, and they're like, are you gonna close your account? I'm like, nope, I'm not closing the account. I just wanna take out all my money. And you know, they, thankfully it wasn't over the amount that they could give me for that day. Cause that's, that's gotta be illegal in some way. That's I'll like know. having like insider secrets, yeah, uh, trading like, secrets. <laughs> and like, you're about to get hit with a lot of chargebacks. Let me get my money. Yep. Out quick. I was like, I got it. And you know, shout out to the people that I remember when that happened to yeah. now. And like my account went to like negative, like, cause it was like, not only it was like, I think it was like four chargebacks, but it was for like $2,000. And to be fair, they were dicks for charging me back because I'd already completed all the work. Really? Like, and they were just panicking because of what was happening. Right. This is um, people, man. And, you know, they weren't big influencers. They they were you know, regular people. So, like, I hope they feel bad for what they did. But, you know, it ended up working in my favor because <laughs> I made everybody sign contracts. And I delivered on my work. So, I just showed that to the bank and I got all the money back. But if you ever had a charge back, it takes, like, four months, five months before everything settles. That's right. So, yeah, so my account was negative, and but I had my cash out, so I could pay my pay my rent. You know, Kristen wasn't you know too mad or upset. You know, and you know I started you know really it was like whenever I get depressed, and I don't want to call it depression. Whenever I'm like have like no clue what I'm gonna do, right. I, I want to I want to acknowledge that you don't get depressed. Yeah, you just hit hard times and you figure it out. Yeah, and I just like that's where the consistency. I was like, I need to do something, and we were locked down. You couldn't go. I could not go get video business. There was no way for because I've I've always relied on I can make videos. Like I like I have a camera and I have a laptop and I know how to make videos. I'll never be poor. Like that's like my belief now because it's it's the camera's always been trustworthy. Now with a phone, it's like it's even easier. You and, the, I mean? and you were kind of new at making that a hustle. Like I get an email at, or a DM every day, uh, several a day from young men who are trying to make money making videos for yep. people. And it, it like for me, it was just I would walk into like coffee shops, like that was another like I would just walk into local businesses and I'd be like, I'll make you free videos. And then I would make them two or three videos. They'd like them and they'd hire me to make more videos. Like So like, I always knew I could do that. But during lockdown, everything was closed. Right. So I couldn't do that. 
Um, so that's when I was like, well, maybe I should take some time to figure out this TikTok thing. And I committed to doing, you know, I like force constraints, which is why I like TikTok as a whole, because it's so short, it forces you to have to make things like very concise. Right. Um, I said, I'm gonna do one video a day for the next 90 days to see what happens. And sure enough, and but I was like, I was gonna educate at this point. I was like, I'm gonna teach, you know, cause the one thing I thought about doing was like, I can make, you know, videos about how to make videos right. on, on YouTube. But that was saturated. You had guys sure. like Casey Neistat. You had a lot of better competition. I was like, man, that's too competitive. I'm not going to break through. So TikTok was new. I was like, I'll figure it out here. And I knew from that point forward, I was like, if I figure this out, if this works, it's a little bit of a risk. I'm going to be early. And I'm going to make a lot of money doing it because I know, like, I mean, you what? I said, my friends like Elliot Hulse and Chris Barnard and Aaron Marino and Beard Brand and all my network that I had built to this point, I said, they're not doing TikToks yet. They're gonna want somebody to do them for them because they're busy people, they're entrepreneurs. I said, I'll figure it out and I'm gonna do it for people. I said, and then that's, so, but like I started making videos and like, I think my 10th video in of that like 90 day stint was a video about a ring light, got like 700,000 views, gained another 10,000 followers. Um, now I had like 20,000 on my account and never had that that fast on anything. Kept making videos, kept making videos, got another million view video. And then I went to Chris, you know, first, cause I think, cause you had just moved, you had, you had moved at the, that point. So you weren't as easy to access. So I hit up Chris, I was like, yo, let me start you account. I'll do it for free. Like, let's just do like work out some sort of rev share if we make any money from this. I mean, and he wasn't afraid to film during lockdown. So like we were going to this, you know, to the gym, cool. you know, nobody gave a shit. Like we were filming videos, we were making videos and he was the first account that I took to 100K, and then we started on your account. And it, and I, th I mean, what do we do? We say like three accounts for you. We kept just trying to start it. We, like, Bro, I've been banned <laughs> over a dozen times. Yeah. So I mean, like, I mean, we did take your account to 100K the first time before the original ban, yep. and then it got banned. Then we reposted, tried again, and it was just got out of hand. Uh, but then I, I had those two case studies, and then I was able to for making friends. Like I met a gentleman named Michael Sanchez who runs the a really good TikTok Facebook group, uh, TikTok Marketing Secrets. Um, he's creator of uh, the Talk Audit software, which is if you're making TikTok videos, highly recommended software. Um, and he was like offering coaching, like for and this is like his group now. I think it's at like twenty thousand. Back then it was at like eight hundred. And I was like, oh, he's still accessible. So I I hit him up and I was he did coaching. I was like, yo, let me buy three. I want I want three hours and 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 I sent him. And I, and I sent him, uh, well, he put a PayPal link. Uh, and I paid three individual times. I didn't send him 300 at once. I wanted him to see the 100 come in three different times. So he remembered my name. And, which is a hack for people. Like, you know, when you see a PayPal come in, it says your name. You says, know how to get attention. You <laughs> hack attention. Yeah, so it was like, so I did that, got on the call. And then, but it, but I was spending a lot. This is the first time that like, <laughs> <laughs> because I was still making videos. Like I never stopped making videos on my own account. And I w and my edits were very different. Like now they're the norm because it's like what you see everywhere. But I hadn't started doing subtitles yet, but I was doing very highly edited videos like with jump cuts and zooms and B-roll and pictures. And I was just filming them on a, you know, a nice camera setup like what we're using right now. So, and everybody on TikTok was using their phones. And I was actually getting so many hate comments. That's right. Like, everyone's like, this is overkill for TikTok. You're stupid. Like, waste of your time. And I right. said, but I knew I'm like, no, it's not because I'm early. Yeah. Y'all yeah. just don't get it yeah. yet. And I, and, I, and I knew that because I had watched you start on YouTube. And I remember it was like, even when you started, you were a little, like, it, it used to be just like beauty vloggers. You know, it started with cell phones. Like just talking to your phone like this. Oh, you know, on turned, TikTok, you mean? No, this was like YouTube. YouTube, like, we didn't have cell phones uh, with cameras well, back then. Remember, well, we, we had flip cams. Flip cams. It started with flip cams, and then it started. Then you started seeing like the the girls talking to a camera, sitting on their floor, doing makeup reviews, and then you started seeing like the you know you started doing long you know talking videos, and then you saw like higher professional cameras and you had like the Casey Neistat come, then you had like the Peter McKinnon come. And then now you have like Mr. Beast who spends a million dollars per video. I'm like, the progression is it starts with a cell phone and it's shitty quality and progressively gets faster and faster and better quality. And now you have full scale production teams working on YouTube. So it's like, if that trajectory happens with TikTok, I was already like eight steps ahead. Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna start with the professional cameras. I'm gonna start with the editing, even though it sucked and it wasn't making me any money when it started, that it set me apart. So like I did that and then then somehow 
Uh, well, actually, the def the subtitles were created, and the subtitles were created, like I said, in July of 2020, because I was attacked by the deaf community. And most people don't know this, because like I, because I was making pretty edited videos, people liked them, and I was getting comments, and I guess a lot of them were hard of hearing in the comments, and I had no idea, because I assume like when you listen, when you're watching TikTok, I assume you have volume on because it's a video app. Well, it turns out like there was a lot of hard of hearing people. Wait, that, I don't understand. Why would deaf people attack you? I mean, weren't well, they a, watching YouTube and is the same thing? Well, because there was no captions on TikTok when it started. Oh. Like the oh, app did not YouTube have YouTube has captions. YouTube has captions. Instagram, like they had already had captions. TikTok didn't have captions when it started. Like the app hadn't even put them in yet. So I was getting these comments like please like they were just saying subtitle your videos subtitle your videos they were asking pretty arrogantly like they were like forcefully <laughs> saying something. you owe us yeah you and i'm like i'm already spending like an hour and a half editing my videos that i'm not making any money with at whatsoever and then i was working on like your account and chris's account and i wasn't getting paid anything so i'm doing all this editing work and i was like fucking subtitle my own video you gotta be fucking kidding me it's another hour of work per video and then i just happened to be on my porch smoking a cigar drinking and one of them said something and I think it was just like, you need to subtitle your videos. And I was like, you know, I was like, don't you have an app for that? Like kind of being a snarky asshole. And then like, it was on one video, like, I feel like they all came out of the woodwork and just like basically called me an asshole and said, I was like, it was like the whole deaf community was just mad. But was me. anybody else doing captions? No, no, nobody was doing captions back then. So they were just angry at TikTok. They were just angry at the app. And I just happened to be the vessel that got yelled at the first time. Yeah. And, from that and then out of spite like i woke up like i waited like two or three days and i was just angry i was like fuck these like goddamn stiff i was like you know and then i re you know reflected i was like that was kind of an arrogant comment like i was kind of a dick to say that and then it turned in i'm like well you know what because you know me i'm like i'm like i'm gonna make the most obnoxious fucking captions i can they're gonna be so fucking big you can't not read them and that was the day the captions were born and then wow. i did it to my video but i did it and i committed to doing seven days because i knew it was significantly more work and after seven days, my views significantly increased. And I was like, and the watch time on the videos went up. And I was like, oh, shit. And you were catering to a small, deaf portion of the well, I mean, population. But it, but and then apparently, everybody, everybody wants it. And everybody wanted the caption. I mean, how many times I know I do, I'll scroll through things and I'm not listening to the video at all. I don't want to hear somebody's voice sometimes. Mm, that's why I read. And, and you can just read them now. And then that turned into, like, there's been many re reiterations of captions over the last year and a half. Now, mind you, all this is, this is the last two years that all this has happened. Yeah, so time flies. Super compressed time frame. Um, yeah, we just kept evolving the captions. And at this point, and then it was at that time that I, I started getting some pretty heavy hitter clients because they found out. I mean, well, Cardone, uh, Cardone's team reached out based on my friendship with Michael Sanchez. So that $300 turned into... The, Cardone's team reaching out to me and paying me now and have for over a year now um, to do their TikTok. And we took grants from zero to a million on uh, six months. Uh, we took, and then we did, you know, we had, you know, the, the Hermoses that we worked with and we still do work with them. Uh, that was equally as fast. Not, they're not at a million, but you know, really explosive growth. And Ryan Pineda came, we took him from 500 K to a million in like six months. We took beard brand from zero to half a million in like six months, Aaron, Aaron Marino from zero to a million in under a year, myself from zero to, to almost 200 K in the last year. Like, so it was just like the, the captions became the thing. And then everybody just started copying the people that were going viral. And now, now I have a team of I have 15 employees. That's pretty amazing. And dude. We're doing this year. We're going to, just shy of a million dollars, uh, like 950,000, I think. I'm really upset. I'm like, I want to sell something like to get that extra 50 grand so I can see it in my, my same credit account. That'd be amazing. But that's you say that you're sometimes late to the party, but I don't see it that way. I see that you're do, you're you're a front runner in a lot of instances because I remember you and I getting together on Twitter. I mean, you were just hammering Twitter in the beginning. Twitter had just come out. Yeah, uh, you know, it never became for you what it is for some people. But you were willing to hop on technology uh, before it became a thing. So my question to you is: Given what you know now, with the state of the world, what do you, if you could predict, what's the future look like? What's the next big thing? I mean, that's hard. Like. So everything about me is tied to short form now. So it's like I have a bias towards short form, right? Um, but not so, not so much towards short form, like the content. Um, I just think like the pe people that will succeed moving forward are need to speak better. 
like they need to get to their point faster. They need to be more clear in what they're saying because YouTube allows you to just kind of ramble. Sure. Same with Instagram, same with podcasts for that matter. Um, and there's this, I love podcasts and I love short form. There's this middle ground of like, you know, five to 20 minute videos that people post on YouTube. I just feel like that's going to disappear and you're going to have, it seems that way. And you're going to have long, really long and short. And there's not going to be, unless you're somebody like the Mr. Beast, the air rack. And I don't like that is spending massive amounts of money to get their view, like to, to produce their content. Like, I think there will always be room for that because that's more entertainment based, but on the educational side, it's like really long or really short. I think the middle, I mean, I don't know if it's going to disappear. I just feel like it's going to kind of like Instagram just got rid of all their videos except for reels. Mm -hmm. Like either like, like everything's just a reel now. And then like TikTok, I think somebody's going to try to recreate a vine, uh, which would be cool to go even shorter. Um, but everything that starts short seems to get a little bit longer anyway, too. And I mean, they might go cyclical again, too. And it, the longer stuff might come back. But, you know, the what people don't really there's so many people that are po putting out tons and tons of content and most rely on a podcast format where they're like, oh, I'm going to do an hour podcast and then I'm going to do the Gary V method. We chop it into this. Like, I don't really believe in that. Like, I'm going to chop the shit out of this and post a bunch of stuff from it. But it's less predictable for this to go viral than it would be if I just sat in front of my camera and I made a video. Very deliberate. Like, I think you have to be very deliberate on the platforms. You have to be, you know, and you have to give away things that are unique to yourself. And that just because everybody has unique things doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go viral. They have to give away things that are unique to them, but also help other people, but are also delivered in less than a minute. So when you say people got to learn how to talk better, what are some tips that they can use in order to help their vi their content go viral? I mean, even if it's talking, editing, what are the, what are the keys to viral content short form? Well, the I mean, everybody talks about the hook, you know, the first three seconds, but I don't think anybody realizes, like, you know, one, the importance of it. But the the hook itself, like, it's not really just about getting attention. Like, you have to not only get attention, but you also have to state very clearly the expectations and what they're going to learn in the video. Mm. So, so like, yeah, I can just say like, here's how to, you know, an example of this would be like, here's why you should journal. Like journaling will make you successful. I mean, yeah, like that's kind of a good hook. You know, that's a hook, but it's like, you know, a better hook would be, you know, journal every day for 30 days to be successful. And it's like, okay, well, how can we make that better? It's still kind of vague. You know, write this in your journal every day with a black pen, for 30 days to be successful. Wow. Like, that is what people want to hear. And now you're told exactly what to do. Yeah, Black and, pen. And then you can even go even, <laughs> even way more specific. You'd be like, write, I am awesome every day for 30 days into your journal with a black pen and, you know, do it, you know, only on lines one through 17. At 717 in yeah, the morning. Like, and then it's like, <laughs> and then, then you say, here's why that works. Oh man. And then you go into your video. And, and That's then you really actually good. have to tell them why it works to sell them on that. Cause you just told them the idea. You just told them this, like what's going to do it. Now you have to affirm that it, and then tell them why, tell them why. So it's like, well, we, good. we are big marketers. Like, so like marketers and marketers are struggling so hard on short form right now. It's, it's kind of comical. Um, the reason they're struggling is because as marketers, like I'm a big Dan Kennedy fan, as is yourself, it was always, you know, give away the what and the why, but sell the how. Right. Well, on short form, you have to give away the how first. Yeah. And they don't give a fuck about the what or the why. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. People just want the goods. Yep. They and don't want the philosophy, the theory. They, they don't want anything but the gold. Like you are just a vessel or you're just a carrier of whatever they need to get whatever outcome they want. And it doesn't even matter who says something. Right. And this is another thing that's kind of scary when you think about it, because we saw this with Andrew Tate and I seen it like, you know, on videos of it, like other people's videos where they're like, you know, that's an Andrew Tate quote. And it's like, mm, honest, I think that's actually Benjamin Franklin. I quoted that. <laughs> it's not just, but Andrew Tate was the last person to say it. Mm -hmm. Now it's Andrew Tate's quote. Yeah. Like if you were like, so we're, we're living, we're moving into an age, especially <laughs> with short form. Yeah. If you can explain something better than somebody, it is yours. Right. As long as it's popular. Like I have many videos now with over a million views where I just, ex I'm not the creator and or the best person right. on the topic. 
I just delivered it better than everybody. Delivery. And Delivery. What, it, what it means by deliver is like, I, I did a video, uh, one of them got like 2.8 million views and it was like how to make money on TikTok if you're broke. Now, if you want to talk about a hook, you know, everyone on TikTok's broke. So I knew that. Then in there, I actually taught them affiliate marketing in a, in a 59 second video where it said, here's, how, here's what you do. You're going to find viral clips. You're going to download them. They're going to change the first 10 seconds of the videos. You're going to re-upload them to an account that you own. And you're going to continually do this until you get videos that go viral. And you're going to do this around the theme. So you're going to pick like at basketball, at you know, health and wellness at this, at that. You create theme TikTok accounts and you're gonna post all these viral videos on there. They're gonna grow, you're gonna get 10,000 followers, you're gonna get the, the bio link. Once you get the bio link available, you're gonna go to clickbank.com, you're gonna find the highest converting product with the, this type of gravity. And what the gravity means is this. And once you have that, you're gonna put that link in your bio and you can continue to do it over and over. And if you sell one product a day, you're gonna make this much commission. You do this over and over. And I broke it down perfectly you're giving me great ideas bro this is another <laughs> awesome thing about hanging out with you right it's like the ideas that pop out like in so that, like in, as a marketer right like an info marketer. that's how i started out dan yeah. kennedy info marketer and so you, you you dazzle people with your knowledge but you don't tell them what to do it seems as if now you give it all away in terms of what to do but then the business is in done for you it's in done for you and or the you know like I, I like the done with you is still like, I think that that's a variation, right? But the core, it's like usually like the, the marketing funnel was like court, like free content course done with you, done for you. Right. And as you walk this, as you walk this up, like you may teach, let's take workouts, workouts and diets. Your free content is like, you know, teasers on like the best things to eat, the best workouts to do. Then you have your course, which is like, you know, a 90 day workout plan. You see a lot of fitness influencers do this. Then they have the done with you, which is like the coaching and the accountability. Well, the done for you for fitness is like supplements and or, you know, like, I mean, surgeries, I guess you could say that. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but, you know, as you walk these things up, it, it progressively gets more and more expensive. But I think the course market, and you're seeing this now with what, like, the average person, the person that's under the age of 21 right now does not want to buy your course. Like, they hate courses because YouTube is so vast with information and, right. and, and like Netflix and Skillshare and like just all these free resources that they have, they can find anything they want. They, they don't need to buy like an Elliott course or a Ryan McGinn course. Like you don't need my course on how to edit TikTok videos. There's already 55 others on YouTube. If you type in how to make subtitles like, they already show you. That's so right. So what's my course gonna do for anybody? Nothing. Right. But what people do, but what they can't replace is you putting time into them and or you doing it for them. right? And that's, you know, I saw that firsthand with my event. Like, and again, I did a free live event. I didn't even charge for the event, but here's, here's what I think we're like, as far as pricing and stuff goes, you know, and this is where people, like it's scary. Cause I try, I, I try to tell people that I work with, I'm like, look, you, the less you sell, the more you give away, the more money you're gonna make. And I know there's a lot of reciprocity, but even like people are like, how does that, I don't understand how that physically works. If I literally give away everything, like how does, how do I make money from it? Well, I, did a, did a live event. And I, I said, I'm going to do a free live event. We registered 250 people, which, you know, at the time people were like, and this is like my case against long versus short. I haven't made a long form video in like fucking 10 years or like seven years, a video longer than a minute. I had 250 people registered to fly to Florida and come to an event, get a hotel and sit with me for 48 hours straight. Like not 40 hours straight, but you, you know, you get the point. And so I was like, okay, now how many is actually going to show up? Well, a hundred actually showed up. Okay. Now, before those hundred got there, I sent out an email. The email just said, hey, I just said, I am going to put on a really, really awesome event for you. I'm going to share all my secrets about how to edit short form videos, how to grow on TikTok, how to go viral, you know, all the, you know, how to, how to manage my team and all these things. You're going to learn it all. I have nothing to hold back. All I ask is, you know, is help with, you know, the cost of the event. And I said, the room is costing me $2,000 a day to, you know, cover the ability to have 150 people a day. You know, I'm going to do coffee both days, which is, you ever bought coffee? It's like 500 bucks a day for coffee. <laughs> Fucking coffee is expensive. It's like, we're going to do the last night. I'm going to take everybody out. We're going to have a big party. Like, and I, I, I said, Sam Cart allows you to do donations. Nice. So I said, all I ask is you donate at least $1 to confirm your seat. But if you want to donate up, most people are giving $200 to help with the cost of the event. We made like five to $7,000 in donations. 
That's such a cool idea. Like, so now I, I wish I would have done it, but I had already, I didn't feel like selling anything at the event because I didn't really need to make the money. Like I, I'm doing very well from the done for you service, which is another lucrative way. Um, I, that I didn't need to make any money from the event. It was more like I got a lot of content, got a lot of goodwill, got a lot of audience, you know, data for my audience, what do people want, what they like about me, like all these things that like I find very valuable that you can only get in a condensed format. But I was just going to say, you know, I'm not even going to sell here. I'm just going to put a QR code up. If you thought the event was even more valuable than the original donation you did, you want to throw more money down, I would appreciate it because still the 5000 that we made still didn't cover what I spent on the event. I guarantee you I would have recouped the entire event. Like just from donations. I think we're living in like a economy where people want to support each other. Wow. Like because of how valuable the content is and the effort and consistency of what you put in it. So you said earlier that marketers are tripping up right now because everything that you're saying is counterintuitive to a marketer. It like, it hurts them at their core. Right, it's hurting me right now yeah. as I hear this, but I see the holes in my business right now as you're describing that. It, it And it, it hurts me too. I'm a course guy, I love selling courses. Like right. I, and I, not saying that there's a lot of people still making a lot of money with courses. Like I, the courses, I just think in the next five years, like a course, if you sell it now, like if I were to sell a course now, let's say I charge a thousand, you know, 500, I don't even think you can charge that for a course anymore. I think let's say I charged a hundred bucks and I sold a thousand of them to my almost, you know, 400,000 person audience, you know, and I, but I was promoting on all my platforms really hard. Statistically, you know, when you really break down the numbers, if you're selling a hundred dollar product to make a hundred grand, you got to sell a thousand of them, right? Yeah. So to sell a thousand, I need to have at least 20,000 people click on my bio links, which means that I need to, to get 20,000 people, which means I have to get a minimum of 500,000 views to the bio link to get that many clicks, to get them to actually even buy the product to make that type of money. Statistically, it just doesn't break down, you know? So I just weigh it in as, you know, like, it's getting a lot more effort in the short term. And yeah, let's say I did do that hypothetically and I made a hundred grand or whatever from the course. Then what? <laughs> right. What's next? Like I just destroyed because to do that, I don't think people realize how much you have to promote on your social media. Right. Oh, I know. Like, you know, because you've been doing it for a while, but now like these young creators and people that have followings, like I'm talking to promote that, to get those kind of views, to get those kind of numbers, you're making I'm talking two or three promotional videos a day, you're posting on your stories, yeah. you're you're doing retargeted ads, you're doing cold ads, you're doing everything you can to sell this shit. And it's just, it's a lot of effort for a very short term payday. Like, and I just think that it's the, the goodwill that's gonna be burned there is, isn't worth it in the long run if you can just prolong, you know, what like the ask. And I think Alex Ramosi is kind of making this, like he popularized this, like, if you're selling a business course, it's it would be very hard to compete with Alex Ramosi right now. Like the guy's giving like, you know, MBA level courses on his YouTube for free. Like he has the the case studies and experience. So like to create a business course, it's like, how could you do that? Like they already know he's and he's getting you know tens of tens of millions of views a month. I know because I see his analytics. <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't compete with somebody like that. You know, whereas like, you know, I, I think they we're moving back towards like, I think, you know pandemic and things made it to where people like the live events but i think it's more of a they, they want the experience they're paying for more experiences not like the specific knowledge right and they're but they're buying into the people that are sharing it like as opposed to like i mean most of the people there really just liked me yeah like and they were like i just love your videos i love the you know and that's you know I think that that it's the personality and that kind of like, I mean, I'll share another thing that like where I see content going that makes marketers like hurts them at their soul is I don't think people should share niche based content anymore. And I know that that like makes people like, crumble. what do you mean by that? So like, if you, if you want to grow on social media right now, the, everybody's telling you to like, like myself, for example, make videos about making videos. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Like that's sure, my it's niche. A niche. It's a yeah. niche. I should make videos about how to grow on TikTok and how to go viral. If you scroll through my account and you look at every video that I posted for the last year, you'll find maybe 10 to 20 videos total that have anything to do with making videos. Oh man, uh, uh, can, I, can, <laughs> I, can I blow my horn here for yeah. a moment? Uh, I did that a long time ago and it confused the crap out of people. Mm -hmm. and that was what I was doing on YouTube. I was making fitness videos, but then I just do in any, in any, any and every question that someone would ask me, mm -hmm. I would give an answer to and that, 
allow my personality to shine. And so I would have people to say, oh, El they still do it today, but these are, I don't know what's wrong with these people. They say, oh, why don't you stick to X, Y, and Z? And that's actually the wrong way to go about it. Dan Kennedy spoke a lot about that too. He says, if you could teach what you need to teach in 24 hours. He says, they come for the information, they stay for the personality. And yep. so if you've got a way of delivering your content, people will just listen to you talk. And mm -hmm. if what you're saying is of somewhat value to them, they're gonna stick around as well. Well, it's also, you know, going back to like the marketers, like where my, when, I, when I say marketers are struggling, it's marketers are telling you to make like, you know, 80% of your content should be based around your niche and your expertise. Right. 20% should be your lifestyle and, and like your personality. Sure. So if you're breaking that down on a number standpoint, if you're doing a video every single day, that's 30 videos a month. So that means 20 of the videos should be like, in my case, 20 of the videos should be about how to make better videos and how to grow on TikTok. And then 10 videos a month should be about like maybe my family, my, you know, pets, if we have, if I have them, you know, lifestyle type of things. But the way that I teach people, which makes everybody uncomfortable, is you turn that, you flip that over. Instead of doing 80% of your content based around your niche and your expertise, you do 80% of your content around your hobbies and your interests. And you do 20% of your content around your expertise and your mastery. And the way that breaks down is like hobbies and interests, these are, this is like how you go viral. This is why when you look at my account, you see videos like how to make money on TikTok if you're broke, 2 million views. Go out by yourself to make friends, 5 million views. Um, the biggest scam bartenders fall for, 1 million views. All these videos have nothing to do with making videos. Yeah. Like, but their interest, bartending, it's an interest and a hobby for people. It's a, it's a profession. Going out is a hobby. It's an interest for people. Um, making money, like affiliate marketing, it's a hobby. It's an interest. And then the expertise videos are like, you know, so you, if you focus on the hobbies and interests, those are how you get viral videos. So now when you get the viral videos, you have, let's say you get a million views on a video. And then you have, then you have all those million, like you should see like a two to 300,000 of those people come back to your profile to look at your shit. Now, when you're doing that, if you have 80% of hobbies and interests, you're still getting a lot of interests and commonalities with people, but you're also, then you have your 20% of your content, which is like, you know, in my case, that was the ex, you know, the how to make money on TikTok if you're broke. It's also, you know, I posted this video eight times and got these results. I still make those videos just very, very little amounts. But when those two, 300,000 people come back, they start seeing those videos because the algorithm is so freaking powerful, it's gonna show them my videos. And if you, you know, based off the algorithm, if you are a, you know, if Elliot, like your pay, your for you page looks completely different than mine. Like yours may have, you know, you, you know, I know you like guns and, and shooting. So you have a lot of other guns and shooting videos. You may have some, some strongman videos. You may have some, you know, truck videos. You may have a, you know, homestead videos about, you know, farming. Mine, you know, has, you know, fashion videos, it has video editing videos, it has, so you want to have, cover as many interests as possible, so you reach the most amount of people as possible, so they're always seeing you, so you're always showing up, because the algorithm is based not off niches, it's based off interests, it's based off attention, so it's like, like Gary Vee coined a term uh, called, uh, the inter it's an interest-based algorithm. So it's like, there's, yeah. and then, so we, we kind of coined the term, you know, in my company, um, interest-based attention. So how do I get interest-based attention? I make videos about as many people's interests as I can. As long as those interests are, you know, again, going back on, if I can explain it better than somebody else, right. then I'm the one that they're going to follow. Right. Like, and in doing that, that, that was what I told people at my event. I said, you, you know, you guys are all here to learn how to grow your TikToks, go viral, make viral videos. I haven't made a video about that shit in like five months. Yet you're paying me. You donated to me to learn this. And right. you flew. I had a girl fly from New Zealand to come 30 hours on a plane mm -hmm. to learn this. I was like, and so I'm gonna ask you a question. Them. How are people so you're talking about how to make the videos, how to get the attention, how to go viral? How are people making money on TikTok? Well, there's brand, always brand deals. Like that's like most people, that's like their first, like, you know, Hey, I'll pay you. T I'll give, we'll give you a thousand bucks. If you make this video, I think that's the worst way to do it. Like brand deals, brand deals. Like, I mean, it's like bonus money and you have to have a really big following to make it even worthwhile. As you know, mm -hmm. um, it, I, it, most people like, <laughs> I don't know too many people making a killing on TikTok specifically right. other than people that are selling like e-commerce based products. Um, like, Things like, you know, like scrub daddies, you know, like shit like that, like, you know, or like 
this t-shirt like very easy to understand like oh i like that shirt i'll buy it right um but the people that are made the, the way the money's being made on tiktok is you're just garnering massive exposure like that's how the cardones are doing pineda like and then they're siphoning all these people back to their instagram and then they're selling all kinds of stuff like they have masterminds they i mean some of them still have courses they have and they're doing all the selling on and instagram. so why is why is all the selling happening on instagram and not on tiktok because it's easy to and people are used to buying on Instagram. Instagram has sort of an economy. Yeah, TikTok's still new. It's like it doesn't, like nobody clicks the bio on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> like nobody DMs people on TikTok. Does it even have a DM? Yeah, they have it, but it's a terrible, like you have to be following to even communicate. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's in my opinion, it's like TikTok and even YouTube shorts right now. Like if I had to say like two platforms, don't sell on either one of those platforms. Just use them to keep getting 10, 15, 20 million views and put your face in front of everybody. And then they, I, I think there's also, you know, marketers in general, they tend to discredit people's intelligence. Whereas like I, I tend to operate on like, I, I think that they, I call people stupid. I think everybody on the internet is stupid. It's like, it's like, well, no, they're not stupid. They're just distracted. They're not paying attention. But the younger generation, as in like Gen Z under the age of 25 right now, if they like you on TikTok, what are they going to do? Probably going to go to Instagram. Right. You're going to hit follow. You don't have to tell them to follow you. Instagram's sort of like uh, your personal spot, right? Yeah, like, it's, like, it's like this where is they my know little good. It has sort of a culture of like personal touch, right? Like if somebody mm -hmm. uh, hits you up in your DM, like you, there's a good chance you're going to get the actual person. Yeah, it's it's more, it's, it's just like, I, I, I would say Instagram's your business card. Interesting. Like, whereas like, you know, TikTok and YouTube shorts and even Facebook reels, it's like, it, that's your marketing. That's like your, that's your advertising. Got it. Like if I had to put it like in a broad, like marketing based term, you know, but I and just even think, Instagram's uh, like algorithm has shifted to be more TikTok ish, right? Yeah. The reels, Instagram's like hard though. Like, <clears throat> you know, they, they, Instagram still, and from what I see, I mean, we work on a lot of accounts. I see a lot of videos like Instagram still like, like I don't, I don't know what's the right word for it. They, there's still a level of authority based on how big your account is to start with. It's hard for new accounts to really break through, still on Instagram. Whereas on TikTok and YouTube Shorts, like my YouTube Shorts channel is getting like 10 million views a month right now, and it was started less than a year ago with and it has zero anything. Like it was a brand new account. Same same thing with uh, like TikTok. You, we start new accounts on TikTok all the time. You don't, you don't even, I mean. And they blow it? up pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, you saw Andrew Tate didn't even have an account. Like you don't even need followers anymore to get exposure. Like that, that, that I think is a big shift for people too. It's like so many people, because of Instagram, people are super fast or focused on how many followers you have and like what are your followers worth and all this shit. And then you have somebody like Andrew Tate who comes in, who doesn't even have a fucking account and he's still the most famous person in the world. <laughs> Yes, he's kind of declined a little bit since they censored him, but even still, people are still talking about Andrew Tate, and he hasn't had an account for like three months, and he never had an account other than one Instagram account, and he didn't even promote anything on his Instagram account. It was just pictures of him looking cool. Like he barely used Instagram, but he had like when it, I think uh, when it got banned, he had like six million followers on Instagram. He was getting a hundred thousand a day or something. Like he didn't have accounts, like, so it's like we're also moving into a world where it's like you know people. Your your followers don't see your content. Like I mean, you've probably looked right. At it. It's it's you make, and that's why I, I you know when I talked about like making content for like hobbies and interests, you have to make content for people that don't know who you are, or don't give a shit about you because they don't. Like they're busy, they're distracted, they're 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 sitting at at the grocery store scrolling, waiting for their the line to move. They're like a lot of people are driving, watching TikTok videos. They are not paying attention. They don't care who's saying shit. They're just like fucking scrolling aimlessly. So it's like when you look at the analytics, it's like. All your views come, it's like on mine specifically, it's like 90, 98% non-followers. Like I, I got 8.1 million views in the last 28 days on, on YouTube and 9.5 mil, 9 million of that was, or even more than that, I think 9.8 or 8, it was 8.1, so like 8 million of that. I'll give the other 100,000 of my people, the 14,000 followers I have now. Mm -hmm. Like the rest of it was just all people that have never seen you. For you page, yeah, explore page. It's for you page, explore page, and or like, I don't know what they call the shorts page. Like it's just the same thing on you. Like, I just see them scrolling by on my uh, yeah. They just, they just slide they in. They just show them in. Yeah. Like so, again, if you make niche based content, you're making it for followers, as if you have followers, and most people don't have followers. So <clears throat> when you do that, when you f reverse that, and you just start making it, like I make videos for everybody. Like they just happen to also get some of my knowledge. 
in the process. Amazing. This is so good, man. So many gems, so much great information. I'm taking mental notes. Why don't we pick your brain a little bit more later, (laughs) dude? It's been amazing uh, being friends with you over these years, dude, and watching your evolution, watching you grow, (laughs) watching you become the expert, the man that you are right now, the father that you are right now. When are you going to get married? (laughs) Dragging that girl along, man. We actually we've been talking about it. Right? We've been talking. We've been talking about it a while. You know. You know. I just don't like the government involved in my shit. <laughs> I don't blame you. I totally understand. But, but no, we've been like it's. Uh, we, yeah, we definitely have been talking about it. Well, you know, she was previously divorced. Like, oh. and I've seen so many of my friends get divorced. I'm just like, I mean, you, you and Colleen are like one of the only couples I know that are like happily together and have been for a really long time. Yeah, praise the Lord. When I look at other people, I'm like, I've watched like five to ten of my like five of my friends five of Kristen's friends get married and get divorced and remarried and divorced and i'm like well you guys not too why bad. are we doing this yeah the institution has been destroyed but i but i do believe i i do believe in the sanctity of it i do believe in the, the security for the woman mm-hmm. but and also just, for the child also, yeah. also for your child to know that my daddy's actually my mother's husband <laughs> yeah the baby daddy thing yeah you know? even though we're engaged it still is still have some awkward conversations mm-hmm. at the school but no we've been talking about it uh we just kind of figure out what we want to do like because i, I kind of want we just want to have like a big party we don't really want to have all the mm-hmm. you know the bells and the whistles Sounds she's still right yeah she still wants to wear a dress but not like i'm like i was i was talking to Luis, my you know my partner in the agency and he I was like, one of the things that pisses me off about weddings is that, you know, all these guys try to dress up, but they end up looking worse. They just look like shit because they all buy suits that don't fit because they're like, I have to wear a suit because it's like a good dress code. And it's like, we got to, you know, show respect to the bride Mm -hmm. and the groom. So, but then they wear suits that look like shit. And I'm like, you should have just worn your fucking regular clothes because you look like shit. Or you do like our buddy Donnie and go to the baseball. That was cool. Donnie's wedding was fun. Yeah. He was at a baseball dime and all the guys just wore suspenders. Yeah. It was like, but, but it's like, even that, I'm like, ah, I just want something like, something lower lower key but like bigger part like i just if it was like a nightclub for all of my friends and like bottle service for everybody mm-hmm. like i feel like that would be pretty cool like where people could talk but it's still like a like a vibe i don't know me and kristen are probably gonna talk about it or like a concert like because making some money now i could probably pay for a good band to come play it's for- cool to see you making money because <laughs> i just know you as broke ryan yeah and it's but, amazing that you've been you've been a great father. You've been a great. I'm gonna just call you a husband because I mean you can't live with a woman that many years. And, yeah, we have common law, <laughs> right? You basically are. You've been a great husband, a great father, very loyal, very consistent, hardworking, never giving up. And man, like it's all paid off. And to see where you're at right now, it just warms my heart. Yeah, it's just trying to keep it going. Because now I'm like shit. I don't want to go away. So it's like now you gotta, <laughs> now you got to work like extra hard. Like there was a Hermosi. I, I I tend to quote Hermosi a lot because I respect him and like I've worked with, you know I work with him for a long time now. Uh, like he's like when it gets easy go hard. And like Chris kind of grand that he's like so it's like even now like I feel like I'm just blowing myself up to keep this going. And like, when it easy goes hard. Yeah. yeah. I wish I would have kept that. In, I wish somebody <laughs> told me that. Yeah. When things got easy for me. Like I, I don't like I just keep I'm like like because it's. I I think this is like a le- like a lesson for people like when you have something that's working like you you assume it's going to work forever and like I mean I've seen it like with the SEO I thought I was invincible right and then it crashed with the YouTube I thought I was invincible and then it crashed it's like now it's like okay there's a shelf life on this like I just hope that I have a big enough well for me it's like two things I hope I have a big enough personal brand when it when it when the shelf life ends cuz I've seen you do that very well you've built up such a loyal audience you know even if you went easy you still have this core group of followers that's like that loves you so it's like i just want that to get as big or at as least possible. they remember me yeah it's the craziest thing people be like well i haven't seen you in forever but and then the and then that, they that emotion that sense of we're friends comes up it, i and appreciate then, that and then when it comes to with money it's just like i just know that if i have this if it's taken me like a year to get this amount can i condense can i double it in the next year and then hopefully at the end of that year if everything were to fall apart at least I have this big nest egg now that like I'll make a lot better decisions with a million dollars in my bank account than I would with a thousand, you know, or maybe not. I mean, but ultimately like the the way that I've seen it, it's like you make much better decisions when you're not struggling for money. Like you make more long-term decisions. Cause I made a lot of really good short-term decisions that have made me that have like hell the whole, this whole TikTok thing is like a short-term decision, yeah. but then turned into, but there's been multiple times where I was like, kind of like, persuaded to do try something else but i'm like nope keep going even now like it is a managing a team of 15 
is a nightmare for me. Like it's super hard. Like it's not my personality. Like I'm a loner. Like I'm like, like one other person if I needed some help here and there, but like I have to do like team meetings and I have to deal with employee drama and I have like prop employees coming to me with problems and I have like an operator who's like, you know, hey, we got to deal with this. And then I have, you know, it was like always, and everybody I work with is very creative because they're all video editors and video editors, like, I mean, they're really hard people to work with because they're so like flighty and creative. And it's like, while I value that, it's also a nightmare for somebody who's trying to build order in a company. Right. Like, and, and scale as far as like, you know, I hate that word scale. It's just like, just to try to keep making more money and grow as a business. So you have to like rely on your certain employees and then find new good employees. And it's been very, very difficult for me to like navigate that. Like there's been many times in the last year where I'm just like, fuck it, I wanna quit it all. Yeah. Like I'm just gonna keep making videos for myself. Forget everybody else, forget all these So parts. what are you doing? Are you taking on more clients? Are you thinking about selling the company? Or are you, what are you gonna do, grow it? I don't know, what, is, what are it your thoughts? It still isn't, I mean, I mean, I can just, I mean, I, I'm super, like, so every time we've hit 100,000 a month, everything fell apart. I've done it three times now in the last year. Bring on clients, get to that point. Everything falls apart. When I say everything, like not everything. It just, it, we, we are bringing on editors and like the workload gets higher for the editors and then like editors quit. Yeah. And then I got to, and it like, I haven't mastered editor training because I'm, I am very invested in my content as far as like how, because of all the clients we work with are so high scale they're they're very high maintenance a lot of them like they're not and they have every right to be they've built massive brands so they're putting trust in us to get them millions of views on the internet so it's like there's a lot of back and forth in the process there's a lot of like you know micromanaging that we have to deal with because it's like we can't have this going on this account because it's going to be negatively impacted on here I and mean, we have had clients if we if we use the wrong pictures they can get like cease and assist and sued if we use really like I mean, we had Getty Images come after one of our, like, because cause one of my editors just grabbed the Getty image off the internet. And, like, Getty's, like, fucking, I don't know why they're still a company. They're such a piece of shit. Like, they, yeah. just, they just send you, like, they, they, they threaten to sue you over using a photo of yeah. that person. Like, it yeah. makes no fucking sense. They've been doing that forever. And, but, yeah, so it's like, but, yeah, but those are things that, like, you don't know you have to deal with until you have that problem. And you're like, shit. Um, one of our clients had a deal with a certain television network, and he had a show. Um, we made some pretty... <clears throat> good viral clips from that said show and uh we had to take all of them down because they said it negatively reflected the, the show um even though it was what the creator said so didn't really understand how that worked but because of contracts like yeah that almost cost a certain client a lot of money so like we have to worry about these things that most i don't think normal people would have to deal with yeah. as they're growing um you know so it, it is and then the constant pressure of you know if anybody's watching this like you know they Gary Vee's kind of ingrained this, you have to post seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times a day. Right. Well, it's like to make a video like mine, when you see the ones on my account, they take me two hours per video. Yeah. Like if I was just working on my own account, I'm maybe gonna do two videos a day if I could. And that's even pushing it. Cause creatively to make a video like ours, and I mean, my editors, like they, the good editors, I say good, most experienced editors do four videos a day, Monday through Friday. Anything after four, the quality goes to shit. Anything, yeah. anything under four, and they're not making enough money. So right. it's like there's a sweet spot. And plus, you know, we're heavily incentivized. Like the reason people come to us is because we we get results. We provide views. Like I'm not just making videos. Like, like people expect to go viral when they work with us. Like my co I named the company after viral edits. Like yeah. it's kind of stupid when I think about it now. Like nothing like adding extra pressure to yourself every time. But <clears throat> it's an implied expectation that when we work with viral edits and Ryan, we're going to get views. Well, right. That doesn't always happen because vir viral videos and like a million view videos are like bottling up unicorn pixie dust and hoping it all works out. So it's, uh, you know, and like, so like I've heavily incentivized editors with bonuses and then you're worried about margins because if the, you know, if the videos are getting views, then what also happens is expectations go up. Are you worried about competition? No. I mean, there, anybody can copy the editing style and clearly it's all over the internet. Right. But there's a reason why I continue to get million of videos on my account and those account, other accounts don't, and that our clients are continually growing month after month. If that mm -hmm. stops, then yes, I'll worry about competition. 
-hmm. But clearly, like, but we do a lot of stuff that most people won't, like as far as an agency is concerned, um, which I I don't know that I would recommend other agencies to do it because it's a high workload. Right. I mean, like I've traveled uh, this year 30,000 miles on Delta and almost 80,000 on American. Because you're going to people to film them for... To, we film, we do videos. huge batch filming sessions. Like we'll film 50. We usually do two day sessions, like four or five hours each day. We film upwards of 100 videos in like a total session. Uh, we come back, we disperse that over the course of three, four months, you know, and then if those don't work, we gotta go back. Like, or if they're not working halfway through, we fly back. So it's, uh, and then if you're running a company, which most people don't think about when you're doing it, like that's margins. If I have to go keep, continue to go back because the videos aren't working, that means I did something wrong when I got there. So we come with a plan, everything's thought out. It's, you know, or at least to a degree, but I mean like today I'm here um, I'm going to talk on su Sunday. I fly to Atlanta. Monday, I'm speaking to lawyers. Next, uh, actually, I have a client coming to my studio tomorrow to film for two days. So we're going to do 100 videos with this client in, in house over the next two days. Then Sunday, I fly to speak to 600 lawyers on Monday. And then Tuesday, I'm flying back home. Wednesday, I go down to Miami to film with Brandon Carter for two days. So we're going to do another 100 videos. While I'm there, two members of my team are also going to be with two other clients that are in, in Miami. They're going to do 100 videos each for them. Then we're all driving back from Miami together. Like, and that's just next week. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you got your hands full. Like, so it's like, but that's what, you know, I look at it like, am how I many keep, people are willing to do that? Yeah, if I keep, I'm not going to be able to keep that up forever. I know right. that. Like, I'm already getting tired of it, but I'm going to, the, the results, are so good. I mean, I know Brandon's like one of our you know best clients as far as results wise. You know, he's getting like I think his YouTube channel's got like 15 million views in the last like three or four or five months, something crazy. Same with like TikTok, like, and then the platforms are just like they love this type of content. Like, you know, shorts is you know pushing. Like, I just don't see it stopping. So it's like if you know, that's why I say like we teach people how to speak better. Like, it's not the videos. Like you could erase the subtitles and you could use like the app to subtitle mm -hmm. a video. My videos are still going to get views because of it's the thought process of how, what I'm saying, how I'm structuring the video, how we're ordering it and what it's about. Like, and I don't think most, one people don't have the data to, to compete. I've been doing this for over a year now. So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm challenging people because if you can figure it out, I'll probably hire everybody. Like I want to buy mm -hmm. other agencies. Like I just want to, yeah. I want to, I want to build the, like, that is like, I want to figure out and master the editor training because I haven't been able to figure it out. Like we're struggling. We've got decent training in place. We're right. doing okay. But I mean, my company could double. That's the way to scale would be to. Editor training. And it's, and it's not teaching them how to do what emoji goes where. Right. Everybody thinks it's about the emoji and, <laughs> yeah. the, and the caption. It's like, Elliot, like say that again, but say it like this or do this or, you know, like, the hey, energy. like let's change angles right now. Like, or, hey, can you send me a picture of you and Colleen from when you were broke in your kitchen, when you talked about making that video or when you were telling you, when you had that like pivotal conversation with Colleen, you know, when you were like 22 years old, when you decided you were going to go full time here and like, you know, the, but you happen to snap a picture of it and post it to your Instagram right. and it's so far your down. Storytelling. Like it, these are the, like, this is how, what people need to do. But the people that are hitting you up in your DMS, they're just, they're from like the Philippines, Indonesia, they're just taking whatever video you put in their subtitle to make it look in. Right. And then they're, they're littering the internet with 300 view videos. So it's like, there will always be room. It definitely for the is flooded. Yeah. There's always going to be room for the person that, that gets results and, or goes above and beyond. And I've just done that since day one. It's been my personality. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, the training of editors is the, I mean, that's like, I mean, it's it's even impeding the entire infrastructure of like, you know, people are like, I want to hire more editors. I want to post five times a day. And it's like, okay. Well, it's like, if you have one good editor, they're maybe capable of doing three to three to four videos a day if they're really good. Like, and now if you have one editor doing three or four videos a day, you also have to have like a backup editor because that editor is only going to be able to sustain three, four videos a day for a certain amount of months before they just fucking say, fuck this shit. Burn out. They're burnt out. And then all of a sudden their quality declines. And that's not a fault to the editor. He's just been pushing himself. Like, right. you know, and then you look at it as like a business owner. You're like, well, you're only working like four hours a day. <laughs> like, you know, but it's like, this is like creatively draining. 
And like the the industry is pressuring, you know, these people like because everyone wants results. Right. It's like you can do scale and then hope things work. Like a clock's right twice a day. Right. You know, if you post a hundred videos a month, yeah, statistically you're gonna have some bangers. In sure. There. But if you're actually caring about the edits, it's like if we don't get a client at least a viral video every month, there's a problem. Like I have a problem with that account. And I'm like, why are we not going viral? Like, what do we need to do here? Why, why is this, you know, do I need, do we need to film? Do we need to, can we hop on Zoom, maybe refilm some hooks? Like, do, do we need to go there again? Is this whole batch a wash? Because we, we have 15 videos talking around this central topic and this, none of them are working. So what are we going to post for the next 15 days? You know, because I'm contractually obligated to post every day, which is another, you know, like contracts and, like there, there's just a lot of it's a it, the business of, of video editing breeds a lot of expectation that I don't know that like editors don't know they're signing up for it yeah when they get into it and they realize that if they're good but then there's the constant pressure of how do I sustain being good because now you're relying on you providing good footage for the editor and then there's this middle person like that nobody knows they need yet and that's a director right <laughs> like you probably have an editor yeah and you have a lot of shit to say. But you need somebody to just kind of organize shape it, that mold. It. Yeah. To be like, Elliot, we can't like based on the last videos, like that's probably not a good idea we do that. Or or hey, bro, whenever you talk about, you know, putting your ass in the sunshine, you get a lot of views. So let's how do, like, let's come up with five more videos about that. You know, and he they have to be studying your analytics. They have to be looking at your account. They have to be familiar with all the accounts. And it's like, and that's usually not the editor. The editor is just like crafting that video. And then sometimes this director person doesn't know how to fucking work a camera. So he may be trying to film you and he's making you look fat. It's yeah. got terrible lighting, bad angles. So it's like there's a, we call them tripods in my community. It's like where you can film, like f actually be a videographer where you can hold a camera, good lighting, things like this, set up a set. And that's like your, that's one leg of your tripod. The second is a social media manager, meaning that you're familiar with the, the algorithms on all the different platforms, what content's working specifically for the clients. And, you know, you just have like a, a direct response marketer attention based knowledge. And then you also have to be able to, to edit, which is the third leg of the tripod. Right. Like, so it's not just the editing. Everybody's offering the editing, but, but they're missing the other two legs. Right. And they're mainly missing the director. Because there is a lot of people that can hold a camera. Like, that's not hard. I mean, there's a lot of YouTube videos show how to work a camera. Like, and phones are really fucking good. Like, yep. so it's like, that's kind of like, just like, it's there. But I mean, I know people that like call themselves videographers that their videos just, I'm like, why you made me look fat? Like, nobody wants to look fat on camera. You know, like, so you have that, like, but the director is the most important person. And <clears throat> I think that that come, I only know like three and they all work for me. Yeah. And the only reason that they're even three is because we post 1800 videos a month. We just see data. <laughs> like, and then you have like this other like world, which is like time stampers, which is like what, like this podcast. Like I, I employ two people specifically. All they do is find clips in podcasts. Right. Like, and they have find to find those good. little magic moments to turn into something like, and the you as like you, know, you as a business owner is like oh yeah I have hours of podcast yeah just just clip it it's easy right he's you guys like yeah yeah it's, it's yeah and he's like no it's not easy <laughs> because not only do we have to watch two hours of you guys talking at two times speed but we have to have familiarity of the knowledge of what works and what you know wh what hook is attention grabbing enough and then did you make a complete like sentence to, to right. facilitate that hook it doesn't make any sense yeah is it a complete video is it is it lacking context is it going to take the the client out of you know like especially somebody like you you're a little more higher risk you talk about more you know more conservative more you know like for lack of a better term cancelable things so like somebody who directs for you and edit and is doing that for you like that's like high alert like if they put the wrong video up you could lose an entire account then what yeah, you know that, don't you? Yeah, like it's like, it's like, oh shit, we pushed the boundary. And I only know that because I pushed the boundary. <laughs> like, so yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, it, these are all things that like subconsciously I've trained myself to think about while I'm talking. So like, I know I'm going to get a lot of clips out of this podcast, but like- Yeah, you just made a clip. Yeah, like, so I, I know I'm going to do that before I even start because I've trained myself. Like most people just sit down and they just talk to their friend for an hour and that's a podcast. It's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, it is to a degree, but, yeah. and you might say something, but like, you know, we've seen from like an hour long podcast, you might get two really good clips. Right. You know, whereas 
you know, in an hour, I can film, you know, we average filming like five to 10 minutes per video. So like at bare minimum, I'm gonna get six videos in an hour that are complete. On, on If you're actually a good filmer, probably 12, 12. So like I can film 12 to two, which one would I rather focus on? You know, so it's, but again, this is like a whole industry emerging that, you know, and again, and then it's like business owners don't wanna pay for the amount of time it takes to facilitate all that. Right. Like, I mean, I charge what I would consider Ferrari levels right now. And people are like, you could charge way more. I'm like, I know, but that comes with expectations. Right. Which I don't know if I want to deal with. Right. Like, you know, and that's, and then it's like, if you charge less, then it's like, you know, you're dedicating certain people. Like you have somebody watching videos, you have somebody editing videos, you're flying a videographer out. And then you have a business owner that wants to pay two, three grand a month for all this. It's like, well, it doesn't make any sense for me to even have this business now. Right. So it's like, it's an interesting, like, Video like video production is an interesting like model, and then it's also the management of clients. Like as you get bigger, like and like even managing one person. Like we work with Caleb, who who's like the creative director for the Hermoses. Like he's managing multiple. They have teams on like all the platforms, and they have one guy that's that's managing this. And like Gary V has like fifty people that work for him to manage all of his content. Like, and then you have like. You know, a guy who's like figured out paid ads comes in. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, I want to post three, four times a day. And it's like, well, that's going to cost you $15,000 a month. It's like, well, I don't want to pay that. I can get it edited overseas for, you know, a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. Go ahead. Good luck. <laughs> right? You know, so I think there's a whole world uh, emerging <laughs> that like it's going to get, I mean, it, and then you have like AI and software is that everybody's like freaking out, like the captions apps. It's like, right. It's like, okay. Like. Yeah, you can use an app to make a video or to put captions on a video, but do they know copywriting? Do they right. do they know do they remember like because they've edited so many of somebody's videos to go, oh shit, let me go grab that clip from a video I did last month. That's perfect for right there. Like, no, you can't. That's humans. Yeah. Like so, but then again, there's like AI might erase that. Who knows? But like I don't know. I'm, that's what I'm fascinated about. It's like the the overproduction of like what like the expect what, what people expect from videos versus how much work it actually takes to do it. Like is, I think there's a huge gap now from like business owners and like creators and like editors. Yeah. And like videographers, you know. And then it's like wedding videographers. Like the worst people for me to hire to make viral short form videos <laughs> are wedding videographers. Right. They just don't get it. They're, they look at videos like like the ones that I post, and they're like, "These are ugly." Like these are, it's like it, it like gives them like anxiety because they're so like they're they're kid like. Yeah, you know, definitely and, are. Yeah, and it's just like they're like, ah, I just can't. And then they try to do the fancy stuff, and the fancy shit never works. Like especially on this, it's too slow. Like I know because I tried doing fancy shit when I started, so it's like, but I don't. It, they, I, I like to geek out on that because it's just like it. I don't know. Like people, people want million view videos. And then it's like you have a creator like yourself. I mean, you've had bad viral videos before. Like until you've gotten a million views, you don't know what it's like to get a million views or the repercussions of getting a million views. Cause like you can't stop it when it starts. Yeah. Like it like I mean, I, I have some videos that I'm like, fuck, that went viral. Like that was the one. Like yep. you know, I would have definitely like done I would have said that a little differently if right. if I'd have known that was gonna get four million views. Like, well, I wouldn't have left that out. And then it's like the the comments, like like with short form, it's impossible to not see comments. Like, cause you yeah. log into your apps to do anything and it's just like, oh, priority here, look at this. It's like yep. everywhere. So it's like, and now with like TikToks and like even YouTube, YouTube shorts. Like I was talking at my event and I was like, like I don't, I can't recall a positive comment I've ever read on any of my platforms. <laughs> All of it is shit talking. All of it's hate. All of it makes you feel like shit. And I'm just like, <laughs> So I, I lean into that. Like we yeah. do shit to trigger people. Like right. say words wrong. Like, you know, like say, uh, like, you know, leave out like a little detail that's gonna make somebody angry. Like, it's like, you can't do that. And like a machine can't do that. Like that's like somebody like, I'm gonna fuck with these people. Like, you know, say things differently. Like, say things with like, you know, like this is where speech patch is like, can I say this really cocky and like smirk after and then not edit that out because that's gonna show personality. Like an editor would just cut that out. Right. Whereas like a marketer or somebody that's like knows like attention. Right. Will leave that like we do it with Brandon Carter all the time. Like because he'll like giggle. He'll say things super audacious and then just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't cut that shit out. Like 
that that's like him. That's his personality. Like, you know, but if you cut that out, he just looks like a giant asshole. Right. And and then and then all the comments are like, just fucking arrogant prick, fuck fuck you. Like it's like choo, 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 choo. it's like some people can't handle that. Like, you know, we have a lot of friends that can. So it's like, but I think that's a different world that people are walking into that they don't realize they're walking into until they're like, you know, we have clients that are like, yo, don't ever make a video where I mention my wife again. Oh yeah. Like, and I'm like, oh shit, man. Then you feel bad. Like, like we were supposed to work with a company, uh, they were actually, you know, they were affiliated, you know, with the Hermoses and you know, it's like a, a children's company. I went there and I was like, all the things that, you know, I don't want to say what it is just because of like privacy is, but it, everything that I'm like, that could go viral. It's like a child. Can't right? do it. And I'm like, I, the parents, like they, they're like, yeah, well they can sign a social media release. It's like, yeah, they can, but they aren't signing up for what I know is coming. Right. Like, that's not there. Like they are not influencers. They like, you know, like, and it, it would be like, so there's certain instances where it's like, you know, also too, the editors are in control of this, you know, whether they realize it or not, they are. And it's just like, like, so I, I mean, that's why I think we're different. Like what I'm doing is different just because I don't, I think a lot of people that are reaching out in the DMs. It's a factory. Like, like, but then again, they've, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've made a lot of viral videos. So it's, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of shit. So, but. Uh, that was a rant, but shit. The, uh, it's the Red Bull. It's the Red Bull. Yeah, I've had like three today. So. <laughs> My addiction. Yo, tons of value, though. Yeah. I think people are really going to enjoy this. I hope so. Where can people learn more about you or hook up <laughs> with what you're doing or hire you or come work for you or yeah, just uh, send you a DM and say, what's up? Yeah, I mean, like... Uh, my Instagram is like my home base. Like TikTok's my biggest platform. If you want to see the weird shit that we're trying, like I always try it on my TikTok first, um, and then YouTube Shorts. If you watch those, I mean, it's all the same videos. It's just Instagram. Like, you know, you would know that I was doing this podcast today because I guess I posted my stories. But like, I post a video a day, pretty much without fail. So that's my consistency and keep showing up awesome yep you're the king of that dude and you're the king of making viral tiktok videos dude <laughs> i try yeah i think that's what we'll call this episode i hope so don't say the word viral though because viral is falls under the covid bucket oh okay no virus uh, you say vi vi million views that's why we say million views a lot you got it dude love you thank you man appreciate you letting me come on you got it. Uh -huh.